you've been screening this film around the, the country and other parts of the world. Can you talk about the, um, the experience of showing this film in uh, Cambodian exile communities? Yeah, it's been really, really exciting, actually. Um, there are, uh, I mean, obviously the film, we've made the film as a kind of universal sort of statement so that it, apply, that it, can, it can have some kind of appeal and meaning to, to anybody who wants to watch it. But when it comes to Cambodians, um, I suppose ideally the audience for this film would be Cambodians in Cambodia, but the film has not been given a permit to be shown there. In this country, which is a very large, that has a very large Cambodian diaspora, there's about 300,000 Cambodians living here, living here, all of them because, well, perhaps not all, but perhaps 90% living here because of the killing fields. The younger people, what they call the 1.5 generation, which is the people who were born perhaps in Cambodia or Thailand, in the refugee camps in Thailand, and then come to live here, uh, and grow up as Americans, and the second generation who were born here in the U.S. Uh, find that there's a huge gap between them and their parents. Their parents, who are first-generation refugees, don't really want to talk about this very, very uh, traumatic experience. Uh, and this film, I think because it's done through the prism of a younger person who is himself a kind of if he if he'd come to live in the US he would be a 1.5 generation uh kind of migrant they can relate to that because the film is in a way the film is not really about what happened in the Khmer Rouge the film is really about how does somebody who was affected by the Khmer Rouge as a child find out and come to terms with what happened to them as a child. Bring us up to date on Sam Bath. Uh, he spent 10 years uh, uh, making this. Uh, what's, the, what's it been like for him to have this out now? Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, I think he's really, really excited at the sort of, glo I mean, the film is kind of, uh, you know, it's doing very well here, but it's also having a huge kind of impact in places like the Balkan region, where people are seeing a lot of kind of um, echoes with their experience. And for Sambat, I think that's a very exciting idea, the idea that his very lonely work that he'd done for so many years um, has, had something, has, has, has been able to touch people and, and not touch people in some kind of passive, you know, curious kind of way, but actually touch people in a very uh, kind of active and uh, forward-looking kind of way. So he's... he's um, He's very pleased and very satisfied by what happened. But I think at the same time, that has to be tempered with the fact that uh, it's still quite dangerous to deal with this story in Cambodia. So he's quite often driving in rural areas. And uh, there's been a few times this year where he's been run off the road in his car by people unknown. The whole thing is still very um, on a knife edge. Um, it's not, a, and, and, and you know, as I said, the film hasn't been able, and, it, and I don't think it can be in the very immediate future, be shown in Cambodia around communities and villages because it's still uh, a quite a dangerous story to tell. Uh, we want to take your questions uh, if you have some there. Uh, yes, sir. What have I learned about mass murder? But basically, I think in a very simple nutshell, it's done by ordinary people. And no matter how we might think that we could never do it, I think all of us could be involved in it if the situation is such that that kind of thing happens. Because I think the two people that, that we really focus on, Kun and Sun in this film, are not people who have ever done any kind of criminal, violent, uh, evil, if you want to put it that way, behavior uh, since. Uh, and yet in that three-year period from 1975 to the beginning of 1979, they were responsible in themselves just for killing. I mean, Sun killed hundreds, about 300 people. Kun killed over 3,000 people. But I don't think they're different from us. So that's what I've learned. In, I mean, I've learned a lot of things, I think, but that would be the top line. Question was: so Have any of Sam Bath's tapes been used in the uh, judicial process? The, the investigating judges asked for us to provide the film to them as part of their uh, dossier of evidence against Nunchir when the film was first shown at the Sundance Film Festival, which is in January this time last year. We declined to provide it to them 
not because we want to impede the trial or the tribunal process or the justice process, but because the context in which this film was made and in which these interviews and uh, ad uh, accounts were, were obtained was such that neither Sam, well, principally Sambat, but Sambat and myself presented ourselves as not being agents of the court. We were not working for the court. We said to these people, Nunchir and everybody else who's in this film, and the other people that we've, we've filmed, many other people as well beside the people in this film, to say, please tell us what you did, what you know, what you remember of what happened sort of 30 years ago. We are not officers of the court. We are interested in getting this information into the public domain. The trial itself will, of Nunchi will begin maybe as early as March or April this year, so in other words, in two or three months, but possibly more likely in June. It will last two years minimum, possibly three years. He's on trial with four other people. And when the court issued their order, which in which they kind of uh, desisted from their subpoena operation, they said that they were no longer going to pursue us through the courts, they said that they will actually use the film, you know, as it, I mean, the film will be shown on PBS in June or July and they'll get a copy then. So, you know, we have no problem with the film being used in the court, uh, but there is a problem with actually handing it over directly because that was not the context in which uh, the testimony was granted or obtained. Question in the back. The reason why the story is still very scary is that uh, the government has not given us permission to show this film is that they are quite worried that if Nun Chia goes on the podium on, on the, on the, in the witness box in, say, June this year and starts making statements about I am the true heir of the I am the true spirit of Cambodia. Actually, there are many people in Cambodia who believe that. There are many people here in, in, in America, Cambodian Americans who believe that there is a real kind of pure nationalism about the Khmer Rouge that should be uh, should be celebrated because they still now see Vietnam. Vietnam, of course, came in in 1979 and actually militarily occupied the country for, for nearly 10 years until pretty much the sort of demise of the uh, Soviet Union, which was its backer, and the various Eastern European communist states. It militarily occupied the place. Even now, many people see the current government as being a Vietnamese stooge. So you still have a huge uh, problem of nationalism and uh, eth ethnic identity in Cambodia and forgetting communism, because I think almost communism maybe has nothing to do with it, really. The appeal of Nun Chia going on television every night and saying, I am the true Khmer, I, we, go, you know, we were fighting for the sovereignty of the country, we defended the country, will still have a huge resonance in Cambodia, even today. I mean, it seems unbelievable, but it's, that, that is the truth. Uh, this film took 10 years. You're working on a new one. Uh, maybe you'll be able to wrap it up quicker? Yeah, I hope six months or something. <laughs>